Okay, welcome to those that have joined us. Uh, we'll get started here in just probably two to, two to three minutes. We'll we'll get fired up. So stand by. Okay, well, it's nine o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Coffey. I'm with Envirotech Services, and welcome to the Gravel Road Construction and Maintenance 101 webinar. Uh, thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with everybody over the next couple hours. My plan is uh, basically I'm going to be sharing some of the information, some of the lessons learned that I've learned over my very long career in public works. So I, I always hate to say this because it makes me sound old and I guess I am old, but I've been in the industry about 41, 42 years. And so that's kind of my goal today is to share some of the information that I've picked up over my very, very long career. Um, looking, the last time I had a chance to look at the folks that were registered, we have a, a pretty large group that was uh, registered for the class, which is absolutely fantastic. So, but because we have a large group, um, we had we have everybody's microphone and video is muted uh, just because it would be it's too many people, it's too, would be too unmanageable uh, to, to do that. And so, but we want to have, a, we want to have a communication as we go along today. So uh, if, if anyone has any questions, any comments, uh, any story, success stories, they would like to share. What we're asking is that you, you put a note, you know, write a little bit in the either the Q&A or the chat function, which should be down at the bottom of your screen. You can click on the chat or the Q&A and post a question. And uh, I have some help today. Um, John Madrid from Envirotech Services is, is here to help me today. Uh, John is from beautiful northern Idaho and is a account manager for Envirotech Services and handles Idaho, eastern Washington, uh, and Montana. A great resource. A lot of you guys have probably already met John. Uh, if you haven't, uh, if you're in those areas that I just mentioned, certainly reach out to John. Again, great guy, great resource, uh, just like myself, willing to help and in any way we possibly can to, to make your jobs easier. Um, so again, J John John will be monitoring those those functions and will interrupt me with any questions or anything that, that you guys might have. And again, it, 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 I, I'm hoping as much as we can using you know, a, a Q&A and chat function that we can make this a two-way street. So I've learned a lot of things in my 41, 42 years in the industry. I'm still learning every day. You guys 
you know, I have, I'm sure found better ways to do things than what I'm going to talk about today. So please, please feel free to share that in the, uh, in the, the, the chat or the Q and A function. So folks can see it and, you know, we'll talk about it and, and share it with everybody. Let's make this as much of a two-way learning uh, as we possibly can. Um, the other thing, just a quick, quick request is if you wouldn't mind uh, in, in, in either the Q&A or the, the chat is to maybe write down your agency, you know, who, who's attending and how many folks are watching. I mean, so if you're, you know, if you're in a room by yourself, that's, that's fine. But what we'd like to know is uh, we've heard that there's a couple locations at least that have, you know, six, seven, eight people in a conference room watching this. And so if you just let us know how many folks are, you know, sitting around a table watching this, and that, that just helps us. We, we like to know how many folks we're reaching with these webinars. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, it would be very much appreciated. So with that, just a quick, quick introduction of myself. Again, my name's Mike Coffey. I spent about 36, 37 years with the Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities. I actually started my career on the engineering side of the house. Uh, I was designing roads and airports, gravel roads, gravel airports. Um, did that for several years and then took a position as a construction project engineer. And I actually went out in the field with those designs and oversaw contractors building roads, gravel roads, airports, gravel airports. And then I spent the bulk of my career, probably about six, seven years into my career, I discovered maintenance and operations, made the move over into m and and best decision I ever made in my life getting into m and 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 I've, I've never looked back. But I think what the key on that, I think, is it gives me kind of my background gives me a unique perspective because I've designed gravel roads, I've constructed gravel roads, and for you know probably 30 years of my career, I was involved uh, in the maintenance of gravel roads. So again, I think that that kind of gives me a unique perspective, and pretty much everything we're going to talk about today. Even when I'm talking a little bit about design and construction, it is all geared towards helping you do a better job at maintenance of your gravel roads. Again, I'm a maintenance guy. It's important to understand a few of the things that go into designing a road, constructing a road from the, the point of view that understanding what design and construction is doing will help us make our job easier and help us do a better job. So again, uh, even when I'm talking design and construction, which is very little in this this presentation, but but that is all geared towards helping you understand the gravel road perhaps a little bit better and and making your maintenance of that easier and maybe more efficient. So, when we're talking gravel roads, there's a wide variety of types and quality of gravel roads across the country. From the unimproved double track road, the upper, the picture on the upper left that, uh, you know, no, really no improvements. It's vehicles running over the original ground all the way to the lower right picture, which is a photo of the Dalton Highway in Alaska that it's a low volume road, but it, it probably handles 120 to 150 vehicles a day, most of those trucks, but it handles some of the heaviest loads in the country because the Dalton Highway services the North Slope and Prudhoe Bay. And uh, it, again, it carries some of the heaviest loads. So it is a well-designed Struct it has a well-designed structural section, has the appropriate crown, has ditches. So again, it's kind of the opposite end of the, you know, you got the unimproved double track, no improvements, just really basic to a full-blown, 
full out design, just like you were designing a paved road because of the heavy loads that it is it is carrying. And one thing I'm going to do here, just two real quick, I forgot to, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off because you don't need to see me, the, the slides are the important thing. And then we'll take a break about halfway through and then I'll, I'll come back on, turn the video back on at that point. But again, concentrate on the slides and I am going to, if I can figure this out, turn my video off for now. So when we're, we're talking gravel roads, there's really four factors that affect the performance of a gravel road. The first is the weather, the climate. Is the gravel road constructed in, say, southeast Alaska, which is where I live, where it rains pretty much every day of the year? So gravel roads will react different in a, you know, a wet climate like southeast Alaska, western Washington, western Oregon, as opposed to is the gravel road built in Arizona or central Washington or southern Idaho that's very dry, very arid. There's just not much, much moisture to be had. So, so again, weather has a big impact on the long-term performance of a gravel road. The traffic. What are the what's the qu the quantity of traffic the ADT the average daily traffic is it a high volume road is it a low volume road does it have a lot of truck heavy traffic is it a logging road is it a mining road or is it a road to a recreational area that might get you know 15 SUVs a day so the again the the quantity and the weight of traffic utilizing the gravel road has an impact on its long-term performance. The quality of materials, are we, you know, specking out uh, with specific gradations, specific strength, specific type of materials that we want on the road, or are we in a, you know, a remote area and all we have is, you know, river rock, or we are just taking material out of the side of a, a cut slope. So again, do we have well specked out materials or are we kind of stuck using with whatever's, you know, locally available? The quality uh, of the materials has, again, a significant impact on the performance of the gravel road. And then finally, the, the ultimately the shape of the gravel road. Do we have, have the appropriate crown? And we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, what the appropriate crown is and what crown is in, in general. Do we have well-defined shoulders? Do we have a well-designed ditch uh, with you know, a foreslope, a backslope? Is it a flat bottom ditch? So again, the shape of the road plays a real key in the long-term performance of a gravel road. So when you look at these four uh, factors, weather, traffic, quality of materials, and the shape of the road, what is it that we as maintenance professionals actually have control over? And that's the quality of materials and the shape of the road. And that is what we're going to spend the bulk of today, these, these next couple hours, we're going to be talking about, you know, the, the type of materials that we should be using in a gravel road, and ultimately, what is the the shape of the gravel road so that the 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 greater operator and the maintenance crews can do the you know the the best chance of success in maintaining that gravel road efficiently and effectively so again just a real basic uh you know kind of overview of of a typical road section and gravel road in our case is you know, we build our roads in the right of way, and the right of way is simply the the land that the, the our agency owns. We have the traveled way, which is where traffic is is driving. On a paved road, we call that fog line to fog line. Basically, traffic you know is is staying in between the the painted fog lines. Uh, roads have shoulders uh, between the traveled way and the ditches. Again, we need we need ditches that have back slopes, four slopes, sometimes called the in slope. 
We have our structural section, which starts from the bottom up, which is the foundation or the, called the subgrade. We have our embankment, our subbase, our base course, and then the top layer, our, our traveled way in a gravel road is what we call driving surface aggregate. And then just another view of that structural section. Again, starting from the bottom up, we have the subgrade, which is generally the, the, the OG, the original ground, the natural ground. We have the subbase on top of the subgrade. The next layer is the base course. And then the final uh, course that uh, we're driving on that absorbs the wheel traffic is the wearing course or the wearing surface of the road. Uh, again, the wearing surface, the wearing course, that could be concrete, that could be pavement. Uh, in our case, we're, we're talking a gravel road is our, our, our uh, driving surface. What I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to show you a series of before, during, and after photos of a project that I was involved in. You know, I kind of debated whether this this would go best at the end after we've talked about the best practices as as, as an example, but I, I thought it's really important to just kind of set the stage that you know even when you're starting off with really horrible conditions, if you implement best practices, use the right materials, the right shape of the road. You can take a road like this that was basically impassable through several months of the year, you know, as four wheel drive or you, you, you couldn't pass through this road. But myself and our maintenance crew, we came in, worked on this road. And it is a road that when we were done, we the, the entire crew was very proud of. And this, the road, after we implemented our best practices, this road is, has well exceeded its design life. So again, just some before, during, and after pictures. Uh, again, when I, I look at this, this road here, I see a flat road, so very little crown. I really don't see any gravel. I see a lot of just kind of silty material on, on, on the surface of the road. I only see really one oversized rock in that. Uh, we have no ditches. We have vegetation right up to the corner of the road. And so, again, we came in, brought appropriate material in. We created ditches. We did some brush cutting, lifted the road. Again, you know, brought in sub-base material, brought in base course material, brought in our wearing course material. And we have a nice looking, very functional road in that, that area that looked very poor. Again, now, you know, this is a horrible section of road. We have, again, no crown, it's flat. We have potholes, we have washboarding, we have rutting, standing water. There's no drainage, there's no ditches. Uh, so again, a very poor section of road. Same area, again, impassable for, you know, just regular two-wheel drive cars. Uh, we have, uh, I see false ditches and basically just a, a muddy surface without any, any carrying capacity to carry larger vehicles across this road. So again, we brought in good specked out material. You can see we have a water truck there at the far end of the road. So very important to utilize water, what we call optimum moisture content. Uh, when you're compacting different lifts on a road, water is a great tool to help you get the best compaction you can on your road. So again, you can see we did some brush cutting, we created ditches, and here's again, the same section, the final, the final area, appropriate crown, ditches, vegetation uh, back away from the, the edge of the road. Uh, again, a section of road that uh, our maintenance crew is very proud of when we were done with this. And then just one more section, again, a flat road, pothole, standing water, rutting, washboards, uh, false ditches, no ditches. So basically, you know, everything that can go wrong in a gravel road we have here, again, by bringing in the appropriate types of materials, 
the different layers, again, the, that we're going to talk about here in a minute, the subgrade, the subbase, the base, the, the driving surface aggregate, and by having the appropriate shape on the road, uh, you end up with a very good road. One of the things that a lot of people forget or they, you know, we think we, we always dig ditches. Well, a lot of times you're unable to actually, you know, dig a ditch because of, of rock. And this is just an example that rock, the uh, that point that sticks out on the left side of the road there, that was solid rock. We didn't have the resources to blast that or to bring in a, a, a rock breaker to, to try and break the rock apart. So to overcome the, uh, the lack of ditches in that area, we basically raised the road a couple feet. And by raising the road, we created a ditch. So uh, we're going to talk about drainage and the importance of ditches and ditching is not always done via digging. It, a lot of times you're forced into just raising, raising your road to create those ditches and they work, they work great. So uh, again, this was a, a project that, that our maintenance crews did started with a horrible road, implemented the best practices that we're going to talk about today ended up with a road that exceeded its design life and something we all walked away from this, um, you know, uh, very proud of what we had we'd accomplished. When I talk about road construction, road design, road maintenance, I think a really great analogy is when you think about building a house. And I would imagine several folks on this webinar uh, probably built their own house. And so the principles are essentially the same. We want to build our house on a good foundation, a foundation that is well drained because we don't want uh, we don't want water in our basement. So there is our subgrade, our foundation for our road. We want it well drained, just like in our house. We want to use durable, strong materials so we get a long life out of our house. Same thing on a road. We want to spec out good, strong, abrasion-resistant stones to go in, go in, go in our road. And then, you know, a great analogy is the roof of a house. The they're pitched on a road. We call it uh, the crown of the road to drain water. We want that a good, strong roof to keep water from penetrating into the house. That's our wearing, our driving surface aggregate. We want a good crust on our driving surface aggregate that we're going to talk about that sheds water to the gutters on our house, to our downspouts, and then away from our house. So we drain roads into our ditches, through our culverts, and away from the road. So again, I think it's just, it's a really great analogy uh, and again, I think it's important because a lot of us that that are on this webinar probably built our own house. So the the kind of the concept is the same on using good materials, strong foundation, and keeping water away from our foundation and away from under the roof of our house. Starting at the bottom of our basically our structural section of our road is the subgrade. The subgrade basically is the original ground, the OG. It is the basic foundation that the rest of the entire road is going to sit upon. So generally, again, like I said, generally it's the original ground with any large stumps, trees, rocks, or organics removed. It's important, we don't wanna have a lot of organic material because the or organic soil tends to decompose and then we end up with some stability issues. You could end up, you get voids because of the, of the deterioration of the organic soil. So, so again, this is what we, we call clearing and grubbing. We clear away trees, stumps, large rocks, and then we come in and we grub the area. We remove the, you know, the root wads. We remove the, the different organic materials. And if needed, we replace with well-drained, you know, coarse aggregate, coarse gravel. That's the best thing. But if we can remove a lot of those bad materials, then, you know, the subgrade, we can start building our embankment and our subgrade, our sub-base 
over the top of the original ground. So on, on top of the subgrade, the next layer is, is what we call the subbase. Now, if we're putting in a deep fill, you know, of, of six, seven, eight, nine, ten feet or more, I tend to call that the embankment. People people have different terminologies for this, but if you have uh, like a, a ten foot fill, you can use rock as large as as four feet. If you're filling less than ten feet generally you're down into about two foot rock maximum. And then as you get closer to the surface of the road, within about three feet or so that to the top of the road, that's what I, you know, that's what I personally start calling things the sub base. And the sub base material, when you're starting to get within that two to three feet of the, the surface of the road, six inch crushed gravel probably is the, the ideal material. But you can use good bank run or pit run gravel as long as it has the large rocks removed, probably nothing larger than about six inches. So again, that, that sub-base material is probably ideally a six inch minus material. Uh, you can use, uh, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be crushed. Crushed is ideal, but good bank run or pit run gravel uh, can, can work very well. And again, uh, if you're doing larger fills, that's what I, you know, again, that's the embankment and the larger the fill allows you to use some larger rocks. And, and I've done that in several, several design projects that, that I've worked on. The course, the, the, the layer immediately above the sub base and below the driving surface aggregate is what we call the base course. And the base course is a critical layer that is the, it's the main load bearing, the main load spreading layer in the traveled way. So it disperses the impact of the loads, the trucks, the vehicles that are driving on the driving surface aggregate. It spreads the load out through the rest of the, the, uh, the, 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 the the foundation materials and it it helps really helps dictate the performance of the road so generally base course material is a high quality crushed aggregate generally it's a three inch minus material and generally it's a well-drained material sometimes we call that non-frost susceptible material. And what that basically means is that it's very clean. It's a clean gravel, sandy material with very little fines. If you have a lot of fines in your base course, that becomes frost susceptible. And that's where you can get frost heaves and frost boils and different distresses that, that, that radiate through to the surface of the road. So Again, the base course is your main load spreading layer in the, in the structural section. We want high quality crushed aggregate, three inch minus, and we want that material to be very clean. You're gonna see in a slide later on, it's generally zero to 6% fines. You want very little fines in there, which is what before we get into talking about the aggregate, we've all heard, you know, the thing in real estate, it's, it's all about location, location, location. Well, in road design, it is drainage, 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 because water, whether it's on the surface of the road or underneath the road in the groundwater, it is the single most damaging thing that we have to deal with on not just gravel roads, but roads in general. So on a gravel road, if we have an excess of water on our surface or in the structural section of our road, that's what leads to the whole litany of problems that we end up having to do maintenance on our gravel roads. It causes 
potholes, washouts, uh, rutting, cracking, flooding. And even if you have the best materials in, in that road, excess water, again, on the surface or underneath the surface, is what leads to premature failure of our roadways. So it is really critical that we have a well-designed, well-constructed, and for this group today, a very well-maintained drainage system to keep the water away and out from our, our roadbed and our the surface of our road and the structural section of our road. It is really important for us in the public works world to really maintain that drainage system, the entire drainage system. And we always need to remember that we have to deal with subsurface drainage, surface drainage, and then maintain all of those elements of our drainage system. Uh, I don't show on here the crown, but we need to maintain the crown of the road, which is our first line of defense against water. We need to maintain our culverts in working condition. We need to keep our ditches clean and unblocked so that we're able to move water away from our road. We have to maintain our bridges. Uh, you know, we have French drains, we have storm drain systems. So our drainage system involves a lot of different uh, facilities that we need to keep in really good working order, again, to keep water away from our road, because, you know, again, even with the best materials, if we allow too much water to penetrate into our road, we're going to end up with a lot of those problems of the, the flooding and the erosion, washouts, potholes, washboarding. So, so again, drainage, drainage, drainage. Probably the thing where, you know, we're all in, as public works maintenance folks, ditches, ditches and maintenance of ditches is something that we spend a lot of time on. And ditches are, again, they serve a lot of functions. You know, they have the obvious function that they collect surface drainage. So rain falls on our road. We move it from the road over to the, to the shoulder and into the ditch. But not just we're not just collecting water from the road, but if the road happens to be lower than the surrounding ground, we have water flowing towards the road. So we wanna intercept that water that's coming across the right of way towards our road. And so that, that's the ditches intercept that also. So ditches are handling subsurface from the road and subsurface material from the surrounding ground. Good, well-designed, deep ditches also help us dewater the structural section of our road. It allows the water that is under our road surface to exit the structural section and flow into the ditch and then again away from our road. So uh, again, that's, that's, uh, that's really an important thing. We want to collect the surface water in our ditches. And we want the ditches there to help dewater water that's already under the road, under the, under the driving surface aggregate. We want to get that out. Ditches serve a you know, great storage for, particularly in places like where I live, where it rains just nonstop. We get a lot of rain. So we try to oversize our ditches for just the, the storage of all that extra water that we, we deal with on an annual basis. And then the Again, I'll use my example. In Juneau, when it's not raining, it's snowing. And so ditches are a great snow storage area. And if your agency is in an area prone to a lot of snow, it's highly recommended to you know, over-design your ditches for snow storage. If you have over-designed ditches, good, wide, deep ditches, that can help minimize the need for uh, your, you know, any benching or winging that you might have to do during the winter because you have all that extra storage in your ditches and that can actually save you money in the winter time by again, not having to routinely uh, wing or bench off your material to create, you know, additional snow storage. So, so again, uh, 
ditches serve a lot of purposes. And then one last thing that's really important is there's environmental benefits to our ditches because what we, we are hopeful is that any sediment that is being carried by the water that's flowing down our ditch, the ditches give that sediment an opportunity to fall out in our ditches, which we prefer to have rather than to have that, that turbidity that's in our, you know, our ditch water that might exit into a river, a creek, a stream, a lake, into the ocean. So if we can eliminate that sedimentation and deal with that in our ditches, uh, again, that's there's definite environmental benefits to a well-designed, well-maintained ditch. And again, like I said, you know, it's all about dra it's drainage, drainage, drainage. A good ditches is, is a road's best friend. I like to say that a a minimum ditch depth of two to three feet is what we should be shooting for. If you can get, you know, if you can get four or five feet of ditching, great. But, you know, in my mind, two to three feet is the absolute minimum. And, and it does depend on your climate, you know, or if you're in a high rain area or if you get very little rain, um, you know, then the, the ditch size can, can be a little bit smaller. But the two to three feet of freeboard in your ditch allows for any water that does get into your base course, that does get into your sub base, that is enough of a depth that generally drain that water out from under the road system to protect your road. So uh, again, get the amount of ditch that you know that you can. Uh, again, a lot of times the deeper, the better. Uh, based on your climatic conditions, two to three feet minimum. If you can go four to five feet, you know, all the better. Flat bottom or modified V ditches, V bottom ditch are probably our most efficient. Uh, you know, flat bottom ditches spread the water out. So the water flows a little bit slower in our ditch. It handles higher volumes because it's flowing a little bit slower because of the, the, the flat bottom ditch element of it, you're less prone to getting erosion. Um, v ditches tend to channelize the water more. It speeds the, you know, the water is gonna drain faster and there's more potential for erosion in our ditches. So again, flat bottom or modified V bottom ditches tend to work the best. And again, Really critical to keep our ditches, particularly in the spring and in the fall, to make sure our ditches are free flowing, our, there's no blockages, there's no blockages in our culverts because we want to get that water away from our road, uh, you know, through our drainage system. So moving on to our top layer now, and when I'll say is you know probably the most important layer and it is particularly the most important layer for the traveling public because the driving surface aggregate is what the public is really what the public is concerned with they want to get from point a to point b safely and smoothly now you know we as maintenance professionals we understand the importance of brush cutting and and all the other things you know ditch maintenance and and all the things that we do during our normal maintenance activities but it's the driving surface aggregate that the public encounters and what they're concerned with when they're driving on our gravel roads and poorly maintained gravel roads is the source of a high percentage of our complaints that come into our public works offices. And as you know, somebody that dealt with a lot of a lot of public complaints, um, you know, it was the condition of the, the, the surface of our gravel roads. So what is driving surface aggregate? It's basically a it's a mixture of crushed aggregate in specific percentages that binds together very well with moisture 
that gives us kind of the, the opportunity for the maximum um, densification, the best compaction that we can get to get a good firm driving surface that sticks together with a crust on the surface that it, you know, it almost drives like you're driving on pavement. So the key thing on the driving surface aggregate is that it is a mixture of three different sizes and types of material. Driving surface aggregate consists of coarse aggregate. So that's the larger material. It consists of the, the fines, the really small, small material. And then the sand, which is kind of the middle sized material. And as you're going to see in a, in a few slides, there's certain percentages of the coarse, the sand, and the fines that ultimately work the best and give us the best compaction and the best cohesion and binding of our driving surface aggregate. So again, this is a key takeaway that it's the it's that right percentage, and we're going to talk about that of the aggregate, the sand, and the fines. Each one of those types of material, the aggregate, the sand, the fines, each serve a different function. The coarse aggregate, the larger material, that's the strength in our road. So that that that's material that we want, uh, you know, good, strong, durable material that is going to last in, you know, stay, stay in place under the traffic action that it's, that it's dealing with. The fines, that's basically what we call the fines that has a certain amount of clay in it. That's what forms the glue that holds our driving surface aggregate together. So again, with, without enough fines, without enough clay in our, in our small material, we're not going to get a good bound compacted material on the surface. You're not going to get that crust and you're going to get a lot, lot of loose material on, on, the, on the surface of the road. So again, gravel for strength, the fines and the clay for the glue, and then the sand does a little bit, it performs a little bit of strength and it performs a little bit of, of drainage to help the, the fine, the clay material drain well. So it, it does a little bit of, of both. So again, the right mix of these three materials is the absolute you know, importance to get the success out of your driving surface aggregate. So what is good, good driving surface aggregate? We need, a, like I was just saying, we need a good gradation. It has a blend of the, a specific blend of the large, the medium and the small rock. We want crushed aggregate for our driving surface aggregate. We want fractured rock. So a lot of DOTs, cities, counties, specifies that they specifically want a certain percentage of fractured faces on every rock that's going into the driving surface aggregate. The Alaska spec, we wanted 70% of all rocks to have at least one fractured face. Some agencies specify two fractured faces or different percentages, but this is where you want the crushed rock with the fractured face and this is all about helping the material bind together into that really hard material that's going to stay in place under the impact of the traffic driving over the top of it we want abrasion resistant material abrasion resistant basically just means we want strong material that's not going to deteriorate under the traffic loading there are there's a test called the LA abrasion test uh, that that agencies use to determine if they have good strong rock, and basically all that is they they take a sample of the, of of rock that they want to use in the road, they put it into this machine that has like basically like I'll call it ball bearings in it, and they this thing rotates and the ball bearings kind of beat the heck out of the the rock. And then this, the engineers, the geologists, they measure 
how well did the rock stand up to to all this 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 uh, you know abrasion that was going on by these steel balls in the in the tube. So again, we want really strong rock that's going to resist and last a long time. Again, we want adequate moisture. That's all part of forming the glue that holds everything together. We want material that has a certain amount of plasticity. And all I'll say about plasticity, that's just the ability of the material that you're using to bind together, particularly in, in during dry times. There's, there's tests for that. I'm going to be honest. I've seen the test. I don't completely understand it, uh, but people that are smarter than me, a lot of the engineers and the geologists, that's something they regularly do. But it is, it is important that we have a certain amount of plasticity, which is tells you whether the material is able going to be able to bind and create that cohesive tight surface to to you know provide a good driving surface and then again that's ultimately our you know our goal is to have a good crust on the surface of our road to shed the water i don't know if any of you have actually seen but a really good gravel road with a good crust on the surface you can actually get skid marks on your gravel road if your surface is tightly bound and with a good crust. And I think that's an amazing thing to see, you know, skid marks on a gravel road. But if you see that, you're doing something right. And again, you know, compaction of every layer from the bottom up is really important in reducing air voids, which gets you a stronger road. So the, the denser the road through compaction, generally the stronger the road is going to be, the stronger that layer is going to be. And uh, again, optimum moisture, as close as you can get to optimum moisture, really helps you get a good compacted, strong, stable, not just driving surface aggregate, but you want that, that good compaction from the bottom up in your road system. So I'm gonna just, th this is a really basic kind of slide that we're gonna go through, but I think it, it, it makes a really valuable point on the importance of having the densest, the most compact layer of like on the driving surface aggregate that you can have. So I'm gonna ask a series of questions. I'll, I'll pause for a second, let you think of the answer. So we got three boxes with different size marbles in them. And so think of these marbles as the fines, the sand in the middle, and the coarse aggregate, which is the large, the large marbles. So which box has the most marbles? And that's pretty obvious. That's the, the one with the small marbles. Which box weighs the most at this point? And the answer is because the marbles are all made from the same material the weight is the same for all three boxes. So if we want to get the most dense box, the most dense road layer, what's the next step that we can do? So we want to add the medium-sized material into the box with the larger material. So we're now essentially taking the sand and mixing it in with the coarse aggregate. So is there anything else we can do to get us even make that box even stronger, more dense? We can add the small marbles. So essentially we've, we have, you know, the large, the medium and the small marbles. We have the coarse aggregate, we have the sand, we have the fines all into this one box now. So is there any, is this it? Or is there anything else we can do to make this more dense? And the answer is we can add liquid. So that's 
on our road system, that's water. By having the, the, the large, the medium, the small material, having the water as close to the optimum water content as we can get, that is going to give us essentially the strongest, most dense layer of material that we can with our marbles, with our road. And it's, it's important to just understand that <laughs> in general, the denser, the more compact the material is, the stronger it is. So again, that's, that's why having the right percentage of materials, having the right amount of water gives us the best driving surface aggregate or the even in the other layers that we can possibly have. The other thing, again, and I, I said this before, it's really important that we want for the driving surface aggregate because we need that to be tightly bound. We need that crust on the surface. This is where it's really important that we're using good crushed aggregate and not like rounded river rock like in, in this the picture on the screen. Angular crushed rock, just it fits together better and allows for better compaction. You're able to minimize air voids, air pockets, and you're going to get the strongest, you know, the strongest layer of material that you can. Rounded rocks just don't consolidate. They don't compact very well. They don't interlock. You can't get as dense, as strong a layer if you're using round rock. And again, the, one of the key things is, again, the angular material kind of forms together, bonds very well, can form the crust. The rounded rock, it's, it just doesn't stay together and you end up with a lot of loose rock on the surface of your road, which is what one of the things that we're trying to avoid. So one of the absolute key takeaways from the webinar today, this is one of the one of the two probably most important things I'm going to talk to you about is the gradation. So I kept saying we want a certain percentage of large, medium, and small material. And this is critical to the performance of our driving surface aggregate. A lot of folks confuse and think that the base course, like the, the material, the base course, like underneath a pavement. So you have your base course and then the, the asphalt material goes on top of the base course. A lot of folks think that you can use the base course because it's essentially the same thing as the driving surface aggregate. And it is, it is absolutely not. And most, like I, I had said earlier, we want really clean, base course material, non-frost susceptible material. So the column on the left for the aggregate base course, that's the Alaska spec, but it's very similar. Most agencies, cities, counties, other DOTs, their spec is, is almost identical to this. And you can see the number 200, which is what we call the fines, the thing, the material passing the number 200 sieve is what, is what we call the fines. That gets spec'd out at from zero to 6%. So very little, very clean material, but at zero to six, we don't have enough binder material that if you use that as your surface material, you're gonna end up having to do a lot of maintenance, you're gonna have loose aggregate because it's not gonna to bond together strong and it's not gonna form that good hard crust on the surface of the road. So when you look at the driving surface aggregate and you look at the number 200, the spec is generally eight to 15%. When I was designing roads, my target, my best success was about 10 to 12%. So that tended to be one of the kind of my target for the fines. But those fines, 
with a certain amount of clay, which is generally up to about 3% clay, that is what provides our cohesion, our glue that holds our driving surface aggregate together, that gives us our crust, that gives us our smooth driving surface, that sheds water off of the road to protect the road, to get lo a long life out of the road. So, so again, really important that the driving surface aggregate is completely different than the base course because of the amount of fines. And I will say from personal experience, I learned this the hard way. I was offered some leftover base course material from a construction project for our maintenance crews to use. I thought, hey, free material. Let's go ahead and use that for our surfacing material on, on a nearby gravel road. So we use this material that I think it had two to 3% fines in it. We put this down to use it as our driving surface aggregate. And literally within weeks, we were out having to do pretty heavy maintenance because it just did not bind together. And so we had loose aggregate on the surface of the road, which is uncomfortable in driving and can actually be a safety situation. So again, really important to come away understanding the difference between driving surface aggregate, the need for a lot of fines to hold the, the, the material together versus the base course, which we need very clean, non-frost susceptible material, um, which is generally in the zero to 6%. And I, I, I wanted to just I mean, not everybody understands necessarily, you know, when you look at this, we, we talk about percent passing. And all this means is, so the engineers, the geologists, they take samples of the material from the road. They put it in the shaker machine. They weigh the material, put it in the shaker machine. The machine shakes the heck out of this material. There's a series of different size sieves, as you can see on the left side, and when they're done, they weigh the amount of material that has been trapped on each one of the sieves. And that tells them, based on the initial weight, what the percent passing for each, each size material is. So like here on the three inch sieve, so that means each opening on that, that sieve is three, three quarters of an inch. And so we go back here on the on the uh, base course, we wanted 70 to 100% passing. So what that means is when we weigh this, we should have from zero to 30% of the original weight of material should be trapped on this three quarter inch sieve. The 70 to 100% of the material should pass through that. So again, just it, it. I think it's just important to understand what what you know when we we're talking about the percent passing, and then the other thing. Just you'll see, you know, we have the three quarter inch sieve, then we have the three eighths inch sieve. Then you know what what's the number four mean? So if you see the number four, you see the number eight, you see the number two hundred. All that means is on the number four, there are four openings per square inch. So that means the rock basically is a quarter inch rock. When you get to the like the P200s, that means in that inch, there's 200 openings. So very small, very fine mater material. So again, just wanted to give you a, a quick overview of what it means when we say percent passing on the different sizes of aggregate. So I'm going to show you three pictures now of different different types of aggregate and I'm going to ask the question is this good driving surface aggregate. So look at this picture and, and do you think is this good driving surface aggregate. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to say the answer is no. So we see I see some good angular rock. I see some sandy material in there. 
But what I don't see is a lot of fines or clay type material. And a really key thing, and this is, these are great field tests to do because you should be able to grab a handful of your driving surface aggregate, make a, you know, a fist, make a ball, and that ball should pretty much stick together because it has the right percentage of the, the three different sizes of material. It has some clay, it has some moisture. So when, if he was to make a fist, that material is not gonna stick together. And one good way to look at that is look at his hands and his hands are pretty clean. So we need a bit of dirt. We need that clay, that kind of dirty material in our driving surface aggregate that helps bind that together. Because ideally you want him to make a fist and that material just stays as a ball. So again, he could drop that material brush off his hands and his hands are going to be clean. So in my mind, this does not have enough fines. This does not have enough dirty material. This is not good driving surface aggregate. Now, is this good driving surface aggregate? It kind of has stuck together a little bit, but I don't see any, uh, any coarse aggregate. I see a lot of kind of sandy, silty material. I don't see, again, any really dirty, fine clay type material. Uh, look at his hands. Again, he could probably just brush his hands together. His hands are going to be clean. So I don't see enough dirty binding material uh, in this, this example. Now, what about this? Is this good driving surface aggregate? And I'm going to say the answer is yes. I see some larger material. I see some sand, me medium-sized material. I see definitely some fines. And I see dirt. I, his hand is dirty. So this ha has some of that cohesive material, the clay, the dirty material. There's moisture. This, this is It's held some moisture. So if he balled this up, I would say this is probably going to stay together in a ball. I'd actually like to see a little bit more water in, in, in this example, but this is good driving surface aggregate. It has the percent, you know, the three different sizes and the correct percentage. It has the dirty material, the clay to bind it together, and it has moisture, which is critical for kind of forming that glue to hold that driving surface aggregate together. So to kind of just summarize again on the driving surface aggregate, because this, this is so important on gravel roads, is as I, I said several times, it's very different than base material because it has the, the 8 to 15% minus on the, the 200s. Uh, we want high quality aggregate. We want, you know, generally, ideally, it should be spec'd out material with, you know, 70% with at least one fractured face. We don't want to use flat or elongated rock. That tends to be more brittle. It's not really very strong. Flat rock tends to align kind of in the same direction. So you don't really get good compaction. You don't get a lot of good strength out of that material. Uh, typically, 100% minus one inch rock. I will say a lot of agencies, so I, I added this, do use one and a half inch minus uh, rock. So a little bit larger, larger material. I prefer the hundred inch minus. Um, if, if the one and a half inch rock works for you, great. You know, you got to find what works best for you. I already mentioned the importance of the fines. We need that 3%, up to 3% clay, that dirty material that along with the moisture is that forms that cohesion that keeps that driving surface aggregate in place. And we want well-graded material. And so when we talk about well-graded material on our road, we want that, that percentage, that the, the coarse, the sand, the fines, we want that evenly distributed across the, the entire length of the road or the entire width of the road. We don't want pockets of 
you know, excess course aggregate or pockets where we have extra fines. We want that same percentage from essentially fog line to fog line uh, for the, the best strength that we can get. And we also want equal depth. If we want six inches of driving surface aggregate, we don't want you know 10 inches in some areas and three inches in other areas. We want to do our very best to have an even six inch from fog line to fog line, six inches of that driving surface aggregate. And then again, just and this is just a very general rule of thumb because the actual thickness of the, your structural section is determined by the type and the weight and the quantity of traffic that's going over your road. But for a typical, stereotypic, you know, gravel road, generally 30 inches of sub-base material, four to six inches of base course material, and four to six inches of driving surface aggregate. I know a lot of agencies will say, you know, that they prefer the kind of four to eight inches for driving surface or four to uh, eight inches of base course uh, material. Again, you, you got to find what works best for you and your environment. Um, but for the, this, this, I started my career actually doing pavement design and we had to analyze the top 42 inches of the structural section. That's the area that we, you know, that's absorbing most of the loads. And so that's where we spent a lot of our engineering time was analyzing that top 42 inches. So if you look at this, 30 inches of sub-base, six inches of base course, six inches of driving surface aggregate, that's our 42 inches. So uh, to me, that's, that's, that's a good starting point. And if you have heavier loads, you have higher traffic volumes, each one of those layers of material may get thicker to accommodate the, uh, the heavier and the additional traffic that you're experiencing. And again, anybody that's been around pavements knows there's a lot of testing. There's a lot of, of control that goes into paving materials, testing the, the aggregate, testing the oil, testing the additives that go into the asphalt pavement. I always like to think of my driving surface aggregate as the pavement on a gravel road. And the more control, the more specifications, the more testing of those materials that we can do, if we have the resources to do that, the better chance we have for success. And again, it's really important to understand we're, we want to have all this, this good material, the right percentage, uh, the good strong material, because we want that that our best chance for success with a good driving surface aggregate is to have a product that has great cohesion, that really sticks together, that uh, can absorb the traffic above it without deteriorating, without becoming loose, so that we have you know loose aggregate on the surface of the road. And then again, the three rules of drainage, keep water out of our road, get water out of our road, allow those ditches to drain the water that's that's trapped under the road, and then use the, the best, strongest materials you can find that aren't weakened by, you know, that, that aren't weakened as much by water. But like I said, even the best materials can be weakened by water. So that's where having a good drainage system and the appropriate crown is really important to us. Just a couple examples here uh, that show the importance of, of good quality material. These are similar roads, similar ADT, similar, uh, similar uh, geometrics, similar uh, yeah, traffic. And you can see the, 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 the right picture, the road is, is bound together. It's a good surface. It would be a very comfortable drive. You look at the left, the difference is they did not have enough binding cohesive material. So they have a lot of loose rock on the surface of the road. 
that's going to be a very uncomfortable ride. That's potentially going to be an unsafe ride because of all the loose material. So just an example of having that the right material and the right percentage can make all the difference in the world on our driving surface aggregate. Again, another example, when I look at this road on the right, I see, I see, I see aggregate, but if you look at it, it's a lot of rounded material. I see some sandy material, but obviously this section doesn't have enough fines, enough of the material to create a you know cohesive surface. So you have a lot more loose material on this. So this road is going to be you know more slick, more slippery. Uh, it's not going to have as comfortable a ride and potentially you know the more chance for spinning out or something like that on the road. So again, good driving surface aggregate really can make a huge difference uh, for the traveling public. And one of the things I always like to say, because I hate washboarding, that's one of my, you know, I'd rather deal with potholes than washboarding. You know, the you get a good washboard, good corrugation, shakes the heck out of you, gives you a headache, makes your fillings pop out, you know. So one of the primary causes of washboarding is incorrect aggregate specification. You have the wrong combination of material. And we're going to talk more about you know, the causes and the, uh, the fixes for corrugations coming up here in a little bit. So I think this is the kind of the final summary. And then we're, we're, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Again, Really important, you know, it costs more money up front to have good quality aggregate, but high quality aggregate in the percentages that, that I just talked about equals less maintenance. And anybody that knows me knows that I always talk about life cycle costs. The price of something, that price that you pay up front might something that might be less have a lower price to begin with over the life of the, the that road or whatever it is may have a larger cost than a product that has a higher price up front but requires less maintenance so over the the, the life cycle has a lower cost so anytime you have to dispatch the grader a water truck, an operator, bring more material in, there's a cost to that. So you always have to, don't just look at, hey, I got some cheap, low priced material. I'm going to go ahead and use that because it's inexpensive. That comes down to that. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. So again, good quality aggregate equals less maintenance equals potentially lower life cycle costs over the long term. We want, again, that good surface aggregate allows the surface to form that crust. Uh, it's tightly bound. It's less prone to, to degradation, to abrasion. The, the material will stay there. If you have that good cohesive material, you're not going to have that loose rock on the surface that ultimately finds its way to the shoulder and into the ditch, and then that material is lost to us. Good quality aggregate, like I said, it can mean less blade maintenance, which means potentially lower life cycle cost. And then when you have, you know, really that good material, you have the fines, you have uh, the, the right percentage of materials by applying a dust palliative or, a, you know, a stabilization product that can continue to pr provide the moisture that is needed to keep that really well bound to keep your, you know, your material in place so that you're not losing the material into the ditches or, you know, off of the road. So I went through that, I think, hopefully fairly quickly, but um, John, do we have, have we had any questions at all or any comments? Uh, none at this time, Mike, we're good to go here. Okay, and and John, uh, have have we had have folks put in their agency and numbers of people yet? 
I've had several. We have, oh. a, I think we have a lot more people on here than you think. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Okay. Hey, everybody, why don't we take, um, just take a five minute break, uh, go fill up the coffee cups and take a run down the hallway and then we'll get started. And we're going to start, start off with crown, which is the, I, I talked about the importance of the, you know, the, the amount of fines in our driving surface aggregate as a major takeaway. The next major takeaway from this is the importance of crown. What is crown? What's the appropriate amount of crown? Can you have too little crown and can you, or can you have too much crown? So anyway, let's take a five minute break and we'll get started back up at, uh, oh, about 10, 18, 10, 19. And again, while you guys are taking a break, please and feel free to ask any questions. If you know, if we're on the, I talked about some thicknesses. If you guys are doing something different that works really well for you, just put a quick note in. Hey, we've had great success with uh, ten inches of driving surface aggregate, or you know, six inches of base, or something like that. So, again, we'd just love to hear what you guys are are doing, uh, so that you know we can we can learn more ourselves. So.
Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started again. And again, please, if you have any questions, comments, uh, please put that in the, the Q&A or the chat function. Um, one thing I'll say now too, I'll say this at the end of the, the webinar, but we also, you know, any feedback, you know, um, you know, was this, was this helpful? Uh, are we dealing with the, you know, the, the concepts that are of important to you? I, you know, I, I, this is a dynamic presentation. I change this frequently based on feedback that I get from folks and agencies. And, and I want to make this as, this positive, uh, you know, uh, situation for you. You're, you're donating a couple hours of your time, I want to make sure I'm covering the material that you know is uh, helps you guys the best. So, you know, at the end of the at the end of the webinar, you know, a thumbs up, thumbs down, um, any any feedback. Hey, you know, I wish you would have covered this, or uh, you know, this really helped. We can implement some of this. So, anyway, just any any feedback that that I can get from you guys. That'll help me do a better job in the future. You know, I'm hoping each one of these I do, I want to make each one a little bit better. So uh, again, any anything that you guys can do to to help with that would be much appreciated. So hey, Mike. Yep, go ahead. Before we continue, can we address um, about strategies to help deal with like Sandy bases and service materials? I know that some of our um, agencies in this region have struggled with that. That's been a, a problem with Sandy bases. Can you address that? Strategies for that? Well, and I think uh, there, I mean, there, there are, it, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a tough one because they, they don't, you know, Sandy soils don't necessarily bind together very well. I assume that's probably the problem they're having, John. Uh, yes, so we just want to address any solutions or strategies. So there, there are there's there's stabilizers out there, and and when we get to to our the dust control section here towards the end of the the presentation, um, there there are some products out there that that can help you know bind uh, and and provide some of that cohesion. That's it's really tough because a, there are products out there that utilize polymers that can provide some of that cohesion and strength that we need in our products. Not every dust control uh, stabilizer, road stabilizer works very well in sandy material. Oh, is that uh, Jason? Sorry, I was thinking somebody was had some. Jason had something to say. Um, the uh, but so I think you know having having utilizing the right stabilizer can provide a lot of benefits. You know there are some folks I know uh, if you're lacking fines, you're lacking the uh, you know the kind of the clay material. I know people bring, you know, import that in to sandy soils if they have access to it and, you know, try to, to blend up the material so that you get a little bit more of the binding material. But I think in general, in general, a, you know, we use a lot of hygroscopic materials, which is great for dust control. But when you're using a straight, like a magnesium chloride, you you still need the fines because the mag chloride is br it it brings in the moisture, but if you have a sandy, sandy silty uh, base, you it even the the the, the straight hygroscopic bringing the moisture in it it's not going to do a lot for you because you don't have that material to help with the cohesion cohesion. That's where having specific polymers added to your magnesium chloride to your hygroscopic product uh, can, can can actually 
provide some benefit to, you know, get stabilizing that, binding it together, getting some extra strength on that. So I don't know, John, is that, is that what you're looking for? And, and I guess whoever asked that question, um, if I addressed it, let me know. If I didn't, we'll, we can even offline get you some additional information. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to get started here on talking about Crown. And again, uh, this is one of the major takeaways today. Um, whether you're the public works director or whether you're the equipment operator, the greater operator that's working on the roads, having an understanding of the importance of Crown, again, is key to the success of maintaining your gravel roads. So, Crown is basically, it simply describes the, the cross-sectional shape of a road. Generally, we want an A shape to a road. You know, we, have, we want the high point of the center line, and then the road slopes off uh, towards the shoulder and then into the ditch. Generally, we talk in, about crown uh, as a percentage. Uh, on a paved road, generally paved roads have a 2% crown. And I'll just say right up front, 2% is not what we want on a gravel road. Uh, so we either talk about a percent crown or we talk about inches of vertical change per foot of horizontal dif difference, distance. So basically what that means is, you know, you start at center line, you move over a foot and you drop down, say, a half an inch. You go another foot, you should be a half an inch, another half an inch lower. You go another foot, another half an inch. So again, it's either a percentage or a, a amount of vertical drop per foot. And again, I said this earlier, the crown is our best and first line of defense against water because with, a, with an appropriate crown, we get water off the road to the shoulder and into the ditch in an efficient method. If we don't have enough crown, the water does not drain freely from the road. We have water sitting on the surface of the road, penetrating into the structural section and causing all sorts of problems that we're gonna be talking about coming up here shortly. So, Couple questions, what is the recommended crown and can one have too much crown? And one thing I realized I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add another question to this. Can one have too little crown? Cause that's really important. So what is the recommended crown for a gravel road? So I said pave, pavement typically has a 2% crown. 2% crown will not work at all on a gravel road. Generally, we are looking at a four to six percent, which is basically one half inch to three quarters inch of crown per foot. I would say the four percent is the absolute minimum amount of crown that we want to put on a gravel road. So again, one half inch to three quarter inch per foot or four to six percent is the recommended crown for a gravel road. Just as an example, let's say you had you have a 20 foot road, two 10 foot driving lanes. So two 10 foot lanes each side of center line and you want a crown of a half an inch per foot. So if you measure over basically the fog line, the road should be five inches lower than it is at center line. Because for every, again, for every half foot, I mean, for every foot, you're dropping a half a foot, half, half a foot, sorry, half an inch per foot. So in 10 feet, you're going to be five inches lower. So just the visual of that, two 10 foot lanes, half an inch of, of crown, five inches lower. If the road was, say, a 12 inch lane, half an inch per foot you're gonna be six inches lower at the fog line than you are at the center line. So important, 
that you you can't for the greater operator even the best most talented greater operator can't just look out of his cab and determine what you know that he's doing a four percent or a six percent crown without some help and so the important i'm going to talk about the importance of having a, a crown meter um and i got some pictures coming up really important so that the greater operator has the tools that he or she can get that four to six percent crown in the road so again before i i ask this can one have too much crown can one have too little crown and the answer is yes if you are less than four percent you are going to have again like i said water on the road and uh, again, one of the, the things we're going to talk about here in a little bit is if you have a road that is potholed, inevitably you have too little crown. So if you have too little crown, you're not going to drain the water off in an efficient manner. That's going to lead potentially to rutting, to potholes, to other problems on the road. So yes, you can definitely have too little crown. And yes, you can definitely have too much crown. Because what happens when we, we put too much crown in a road, drivers feel it creates an uncomfortable driving situation if they try to stay in their lane. So what happens, they tend to crowd the center line or they straddle the center line, which it causes problems, obviously a safety problem. If you have a two lane road and, and traffic is, you know, running down the center line of the road, straddling center line. And again, if in the winter time, and I have actually seen cars, stopped cars on highly crowned roads slide off of the road just because of the, the, the gradient of the, the, the crown on the road. So we we want to be very careful in that. So uh, this is a great example. I mean, look at that car. To me, that would be a very uncomfortable driving situation. And I know in this particular instance, this is a 10-foot driving lane or it's a 20-foot road, two 10-foot driving lanes. There's 13 inches of crown here. So what did I say? I said five inches of crown would be a half an inch per foot for a uh, for a 10 foot road. So this road has essentially twice the recommended crown and very uncomfortable. Uh, so, you know, this driver most likely is going to end up crowding center line when he starts, starts driving down the road. Another good example. And, you know, when you're doing your road patrols, you know, you can look at the road and see where people are driving. You know, the people are straddling the center line on this road. There's there's too much crown. There's very little traffic on each side of the road, like where this the car is parked and on the other side. So again, this is a good example where too much crown, we're driving all the vehicles basically to straddle the center line of the road which is not good for the life of the road and it potentially creates safety hazards. So again, you know, this is what we want. We see two distinct direction, you know, lanes of travel. We want four distinct wheel paths. And so again, th this, this is a, a, a good example. And I mentioned that, you know, if you are driving everybody to the center line, you can actually wear out your road sooner. So, you know, think about it. If you have a road with 100, 180 T, 50, 50 cars in each direction. So you typically should have, you know, 50 cars over any single spot on the road during that day. If you now drive everybody to the, force everybody to the center line, instead of having four distinct wheel paths, you've now taken that 100 cars, instead of spreading them out over four distinct wheel paths, you are now putting those 100 cars into two distinct wear, pa wear paths, 
potentially you're wearing your road out much quicker. So there's there's a, a you know not just a safety reason for making sure that we have the appropriate crown, but there's a financial reason because uh, you know if the road wears out, we're going to have to be doing more and additional maintenance on that. So here's some again various slope meters. Um, I think I haven't bought one for quite a while, but I think, you know, you can still just for a couple hundred dollars and correct me if I'm wrong in the, the chat, because I'd like to know what, what the current prices are, but lots of different types, the electronic meters, the, the kind of the, the, the manual ones. Uh, but, you know, as, as, as someone that led a lot of maintenance folks, my goal was always to try and give the crews the tools they needed to succeed. And to me, having that slope meter in the grader is something critical so that that, that grader operator can be successful when, when he or she is out grading the road. So um, give, give them the tools that they need. And this is one of the best, and I think fairly inexpensive tools that we can provide to our, our our professional grader operators. Uh, again, just a, a great example of, you know, we have a road on the, the right with, with the appropriate crown. We have the road on the left with uh, just a 2% crown. We have washboarding, we have potholing. Uh, looks like we have some, some running off to the side. So again, uh, a 2% crown works great on pavement, works great on concrete, does not work at all on a gravel road. So again, 4% minimum, 4 to 6% is what we should be shooting for for our crown. Another great example, just not enough crown on this road, potholes, washboarding, uh, see a little bit of ruts. This would be a very uncomfortable drive. Uh, roads like this is what leads to a lot of calls coming into our foreman, our superintendents, our uh, public works directors, people complaining about the condition of the roadway. One of the things we as professional maintenance folks need to be aware of is there is one, one thing that we do that can cause problems on our road. And that is, it's what's called rounded or parabolic crown. And what happens is if we aren't keeping an eye on our blades, the conditions of our blades, uh, we can end up, you know, if we get unequal wear in our blades, like this picture shows, you know, really, really good. The, you know, there's quite a difference, so several inch difference at center line of the, the blade as uh, the edge, cutting edge as there is on the ends, you run down the, the road with this and you're gonna end up with a really strange, a parabol what's called a parabolic crown. You're not gonna get good drainage off the road and you're gonna have a, you know, an, an uncomfortable ride. So we should be rotating our, our blades, our cutting edges, we can, actually you know straighten them with a torch and one thing to consider you know we used to use just the straight steel blades consider the carbide tipped bits or the the carbide type um, cutting edges because they last a lot longer they don't wear as much but the greater operator we definitely need to be aware of the impact that the uneven wear on our cutting edges can have when we're out blading roads. So again, here's another example. And then I think this is probably, a, this is one of the best examples. So this can be corrected again with a cutting torch, uh, you know, rotating blades around. And, you know, you should be doing your inspections every day before you leave the, before you leave the maintenance yard, your CDL required inspections. And so make sure your cutting edges are, are in good shape and, and even across the, the length of the blade. Another component on our road is the shoulders and shoulders play a key role in, in, in several instances on, uh, on, in our road system. 
shoulders support the edge of the traveled way. If the shoulders are wide enough, they provide a, you know, a safety area for disabled vehicles, or if you need to pull off the road to, you know, talk on your cell phone, they help expedite getting water away from the road. Uh, the shoulders generally have a slightly uh, steeper crown uh, grade than the road itself. So it gets water uh, away from the road, onto the forced slope of the ditch and into the ditch and away from the road. We want to avoid higher low, low shoulders, uh, particularly the, the low shoulders. If you know we have my, motorcycles using our roads, that, that creates a safety safety issue. And that's the same thing with the avoid steep drop-offs. So we want a smooth shoulder that transitions from the traveled way to the fore slope of our ditch. One of the major problems we have on our shoulders, and this is something that, that in maintenance, we, my experiences, we spend a lot of time dealing with, is what's called high shoulders or secondary ditches. And high shoulders, secondary ditches can cause a lot of damage to our roads because they pre it prevents water from, uh, even if we have our 5% you know, uh, crown, so we have an appropriate crown, if we end up with a, a high shoulder or a secondary ditch, we're not getting water off of the road, which leads to, again, all sorts of problems because, again, water sitting on the road, the road seeps in and creates soft spots and then leads to other, you know, erosion and other problems that we have. So, again, a great example of a problem caused by a high shoulder. So, the causes of high shoulders are several different causes. Improper maintenance is, is a big cause of this. So if you as the grader operator are losing or spilling material off the toe of your, your, your bull board while you're blading, you're basically leaving a little dam. Uh, and so when you're done blading, if you've been, again, losing that material off the toe of your blade, you basically are going to prevent any water that's draining down from getting into onto the shoulder and into the ditch. So again, be very careful that you're not creating a, essentially a dam by spilling material off of your off of your moldboard. And also make sure you're not digging to, you know, you're not digging into the shoulder at the using the toe of your moldboard because that can actually lead to the creation of a ditch. The water drains you know, perpendicular to center line and then hits that little groove that you, you, you left in the road. And then the water is gonna start running down parallel on the road causing problems. So again, those are things that we as maintenance professionals, professionals need to be aware of. And it's particularly the greater operator that if you if you are doing some improper grading, you can create the high shoulder or the uh, the secondary ditch. And and the other causes. So if you know if we start losing the bond of our driving surface aggregate, we start getting loose material on the surface of the road. And just like we talk about in winter maintenance, when we're putting sand or salt or other material, complex chlorides down on the road, we know we get traffic that kind of moves that material over to the shoulder. So eventually loose aggregate on our road can bounce over essentially to the shoulder, creating a dam preventing water from leaving the road. So again, we need to keep our eye on that, that loose aggregate on the road, particularly the material that's already made it over to the, to the shoulder because that's essentially creating a dam that's gonna prevent the water from getting into the ditch. And then also if we have weak spots and we have heavy loads, it basically can create ruts in the road and the rut essentially acts as a secondary ditch. Uh, the water is gonna drain over, get into that rut, 
And then if there's any grade to the road, it's going to start running, you know, down grade in the in the rut, causing damage to the road. So we want to be very careful about that. And then winter sand buildup, something we don't necessarily think of because it's two different seasons. But if you are using a lot of sand on your gravel roads in the wintertime, uh, eventually that sand tends to end up on the shoulder because of traffic. Uh, so be very aware in the spring that after winter, you may need to go remove, you know, blade that, that uh, accumulated sand off the side of the road, because that can be creating that, that high shoulder preventing water from, from getting off of the road. One of the things that we do in maintenance, it's, it's, this is a really important element, and we spend a lot of time doing this, is what we call pulling the shoulder. And again, we have those, those larger aggregates that end up bouncing over and they, they end up on the shoulder. That's valuable material. That material generally, if it's just on the shoulder, that can be brought back onto the road, wind road into, you know, the other material as you're blading the road, you can reuse, reincorporate that material that you've pulled off of the shoulder and reuse that on your road. Now you do have to watch if you have a lot of vegetation, you don't necessarily want to, you want to make sure the material is fairly clean. It doesn't have a lot of vegetation and you can you can you know use the material and that's why we always say shoulder pulling and ditch cleaning should be done as separate operations shoulder material can generally be reused ditch material because it tends to be silty muddy there's other debris and 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 vegetation that gets into it ditch material generally gets hauled off. So shoulder pulling is really a key way to, to continue to utilize that valuable material, that driving surface aggregate that is very expensive. And again, reincorporate that material from the shoulder back into and onto the road. Just an example, good looking, good looking shoulder, uh, water is going to drain off of the road, get to the shoulder and get it away into the ditch away from from the road. And we're going to we're going to move into uh, I'm speeding up here a little bit because we're we're I'm, I'm running a little long. Um, just I'll check with John again real quick. Any questions, comments uh, come in yet? Uh, nothing yet. Guys, feel free to ask any questions and we will definitely answer them. Okay, so what is surface maintenance? And it's I think it's important to understand that no matter how well the road is designed or constructed, eventually gravel roads require some, some maintenance. And it's generally, you have traffic running over the road. So, you know, there is gonna be degradation. There is going to be, loosening of material, the potential to lose your crown. So again, every gravel road needs some sort of periodic reshaping, shoulder pulling, um, you know, cutting below potholes, fixing uh, corrugations. You know, we typically need to be out reestablishing the crown and the proper cross slope. Like I just said, we need to be, you know, pulling the shoulder, bring the loose stones back into the road surface. And then a lot of agencies do the dust stabilization, dust control. That's generally an annual event for, for um, many, many agencies across the United States. So uh, again, no matter how well the road is constructed, they ultimately require a certain amount of surface maintenance on a regular basis. 
and in order for a, I think in order for an operator to, you know, perform at, at their highest level, and I'm not going to say even just the, the, the operator, but I think everyone in the, you know, in the chain of command, the, the, the foreman, the superintendent, the manager, the public works director, the maintenance engineer, I think everybody needs to understand the importance of the having a well-crowned driving surface, the four to six percent road or crown, a shoulder that slopes away from the, the traveled way to get material off of the travel way and into the ditch, and then the importance of a ditch. So the greater operator in the field, that's these are the main things that the operator is, is working on doing, getting that crown surface, maintaining that shoulder and maintaining the ditch. So ultimately when the greater operator is done at the end of the day, how do we know, you know, what, what are they striving for? What are the characteristics of a good gravel road? So again, just kind of repeating here, the grout, when the, when the operator is done, we want a four to 6% crown. We want a good hard crust on the road to protect the water from penetrating the road and to get water off, off the road to the shoulder and into the ditch. We need the effective drainage system, good, clear ditches, unobstructed uh, culverts. We want granular material that is distributed at an even depth across the road. Again, if we want a six inches of driving surface aggregate, we want six inches at each fog line and at center line. We don't want uneven depth across the road or you will get uneven wear essentially on, on the, the driving surface. We want granular material that is well graded. And that means that the, the required distribution of the coarse, the sand and the fine materials. We don't want you know, a, a, a pocket where we have a lot, we have excess uh, coarse aggregate. That area is not gonna bind together. You're gonna get loose material. So we want that, that well-graded granular material across the entire road. And when the operator is done at the end of the day, there should be no potholes, no washboards, no secondary ditches, no high shoulders, no rutting or, no, or any other problems. When you're doing your road patrols, there's there's several indications of when we need to be doing surface maintenance. So again, excessive dust, that's a key thing. That's really, that's I think the next thing we're gonna talk about, really important. When we see a lot of dust, we're losing valuable material into the air and there's things we can do to, to prevent dusting. We, if we see loose stone on the surface or we see loose stone on the shoulders and windrows, that's a definite indication for surface maintenance because we've now created potentially high shoulders, which if it's, we start getting rain, we're going to have issues with that. If we see water flowing parallel with the road in ruts, we're, that's that's an indication for surface maintenance because we have water on the road and penetrating into the road. So we're, we're basically causing weak spots in the road. Again, the typical, if we see potholes, we see washboarding, uh, we notice we have a loss of crown. Any one of these topics, uh, these bullets above are indications for uh, that we should be scheduling some sort of surface maintenance to address these maintenance issues. Every gravel road to a greater or lesser extent, if it has traffic on it, will give off a certain amount of dust. And that top picture, another picture of the Dalton Highway, you can see just two motorcycles are throwing up a pretty good cloud of dust. Uh, one of the things in Alaska, um, part of my job, I oversaw uh, all the airports in the state also beyond besides the roads for maintenance and operations. And we had a lot of gravel airstrips. And so we were constantly dealing with 
uh, dust control on our on our airports. So the again the the uh, every road is prone to to dusting under traffic. The amount of dust a road is going to put up basically is is determined by the type of gravel, the the type of what the driving surface aggregate is is comprised of, the volume and the type of traffic. Again, is it low volume? Is it a high volume road? Do we have heavy trucks? And what's the climate? Again, is it in a wet climate that's going to you know get get periodic rains to help? with that cohesion, that glue to keep our, our driving surface together? Or is it a, a dry, arid location that's gonna need some assistance through dust control products to keep, keep the, the dust down? Dust-related issues, there's a lot of them. Uh, you know, loss of fines. When you look at the picture, uh, that dust going out in the field, that's lost. That, fine material that we need in our road for that cohesion, we've lost that. There's potential environmental impacts. That could be an orchard or a farm uh, adjacent to the road. And, and you know, you're putting that dust into the into the fields. Uh, there's health concerns about dusting, people with asthma, COPD, other breathing issues. Uh, dust can be very harmful to those folks. And again, Anybody that uh, is in a position that takes complaints from the public, uh, dusting is a, you, you get complaints from homeowners, adjacent property owners, and the traveling public. So controlling dust can help minimize some of those complaints. Again, we're losing our binder, and it's, this is ultimately means it's going to lead to more surface maintenance because we're going to end up with more loose rocks on the surface of the road and it's going to require more maintenance. And then ultimately, if we lose enough of our fines, we lose the ability to bind, to have that cohesion, we're going to have to be doing a regraveling uh, at great expense. So uh, again, lots of dust related issues and the, the, the cost for dust Again, talked about traffic. Any road that has traffic is prone to some level of dusting. Uh, poor surface aggregate, not having the right mix, not having the right uh, amount of fines, not having that dirty clay to help bind things together. And then a really uh, important element is, is not enough moisture, not enough of, of the moisture to, to really form that glue with the fines uh, to bind the driving surface aggregate together. So what can we as maintenance professionals do about dust? And again, this is a bad picture because you, we should not be grading when the road is dry. And when I see a grader doing, you know, surface maintenance and there's a dust cloud, this is not the time for him to be doing that, that blading unless he, has, he or she has access to a water truck because moisture in the road is really important when we're either doing dragging, blading, grading, you need to have some moisture in the road. Lots of different products out there to help control dust, so uh, stabilizers, dust control. Probably the most common type of products in use across the country, probably across the world, are hygroscopic chlorides, which are products like magnesium chloride that actually draw moisture out of the air. So even in the driest, most arid climates, there's usually moisture during the nighttime. As things cool down, there is moisture in the air at night and a good hygroscopic magnesium chloride can suck the moisture, basically draw the moisture out of the air and bring that moisture into the driving surface aggregate to keep things bound together. So Again, big word, hygroscopic, it just means it, it will bring moisture out of the air. Again, mag chloride is probably the most common product for that. 
calcium chloride is another uh, another hygroscopic chloride. I know some folks try to use sodium chloride, but sodium chloride is not hygroscopic, and so it it in my mind it doesn't it just does not work very well. Uh, again, just real quick, Envirotech has several different uh, potential solutions. Uh, I'm not going to go into this. Uh, you're, I'm going to have contact information at the end of the presentation. Uh, John would love to talk to you folks about anybody in his area would love to talk about uh, things and biotech service solutions. Um, and we have a full line of uh, hygroscopic magnesium chloride and products that have polymers in it that can work very well in those sandy, uh, sandy, silty soils because of the, the polymers, the additions to the magnesium chloride. So I'm gonna kind of skip through this, wanna keep, keep moving. So again, when we're doing dust control, when you apply a magnesium chloride, like our road saver or our DuraBlend to a road system, you end up with a very, you know, you, you get that crust, you get a hard surface, you get a surface that you could almost, you, you could get skid marks on. And so what's really important is make sure the road has the appropriate crown, is smooth, doesn't have potholes, doesn't have corrugations, because when you apply a good dust control product, you basically memorialize any of those irregularities in the road. So if you have a, a small pothole in a road and you apply like our road saver product, because the, the magnesium chloride forms that hard crust, you just basically made that pothole permanent until you 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 know grade up the road again. So make sure you're doing really good maintenance on the road before you apply the dust palliative. Uh, again, make sure you have the right crown because if you again, if you have a three percent crown or a two percent crown and you put down your dust palliative, you now are stuck with a two to three percent crown until you regrade the road. So really important, you know, work with your vendor, whether it's us, whether it's somebody else. Uh, vendors can can you know work with you and and help you uh, you know make sure that the roads are in the appropriate shape before we apply or the any other vendor applies the material to your road. That's really important. Lots of benefits to using dust control. Basically, you're going to reduce dusting. You're going to keep the, the fines on the road by keeping that glue, that cohesion in the driving surface aggregate. You're going to minimize the amount of loose rock on the road, on the surface of the road. You're going to minimize the amount of high shoulders formed by the windrows of that, that loose aggregate as it gets over to the shoulder. This all means reduced greater and blade maintenance on the road, which means lower, potentially, you know, it's lower costs, lower life cycle costs. Uh, you're going to have a smoother ride. So you improve safety. And then, like we said, dust has both environmental and human impacts. And by, by you know, implementing uh, dust control, you can reduce those environmental impacts. So the, the, the last couple of things here, again, washboarding, we talked about that earlier. There's four main causes of, wa of washboarding roads, lack of moisture, uh, traffic, people's driving habits, uh, where they tend to accelerate and brake, poor quality gravel, and lack of crown on the surface. So what happens with, you tend to get some of the, the coarser material tends to kind of float to the surface of the road and it, it with traffic on it, it kind of, it forms into these corrugations, this washboard pattern. 
um, which is very, very tough. It's again, it's one of the things I hate the most. In the maintenance world, what we need to do is cut to the bottom of the corrugations, just like we need to cut to the bottom of any potholes when we're doing that maintenance. You can't just blade loose material into the, core, the, the dip of the corrugation, just like you can't just fill loose material into a pothole for long-term success. So again, if you have areas with, with uh, uh, corrugations, we need good quality gravel. Again, this is where stabilizers can help bind that material together and can delay the formation of any corrugations. Uh, again, where we tend to see corrugations a lot of times is on hills, curves, intersections, driveways, areas that are, you know, where people are kind of rapidly accelerating, people are putting their brakes on, that's where things tend to happen. Uh, again, people are, are accelerating as they come to steep hills. And so one of the things that, that I, we found that, that can work in areas that are prone to washboarding, particularly if it's like on a hill, is to reduce the size of your larger material. So because it's, it's, it's that larger material that tends to come loose and form the washboards. So if you're typically using maybe a, a one, one and a half inch minus, maybe drop that size down to a one inch minus, or if you're using a one inch, maybe a three quarter. So that's, that's just a rule of thumb that we found that, that works on some areas that are prone to, um, prone to corrugations. I had mentioned earlier about potholes. Pretty much anytime you see potholes on a road, you have inadequate uh, crown and potholes is all about drainage. So the solution to, you know, fixing potholes is, is to blade to the bottom of the pothole, get all the way down to the bottom, reestablish crown, make sure you have adequate ditches. Uh, if your ditches, you know, uh, if you, if you have the crown and you are still getting some potholes, you know, you may need a deeper ditch, get the water off the road and away from the road. And, but again, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, if you have adequate crown, you're not going to have potholes on your road because that's, that's a, that's a problem directly related to drainage off of the road. I mentioned this earlier, the best time to blade roads, blade, grade, or drag roads is when there's moisture present. The best time, and when we, in the Alaska DOT, we used to always schedule our heavy, our heavy gravel road maintenance is in the spring, BS, after things thawed out, because there's a lot of moisture in the ground which makes it a lot easier to blade and, uh, and work on our gravel roads. So uh, again, we want moisture generally after a rain, get your graders out on the road. Um, if you go through long periods without rain, that's where water trucks come into play. Um, but you don't want to be blading on really dry roads if you can help it at all. And then finally, this is my last slide. Um, again, just like on paved roads, we do over maintenance overlays. We, uh, we do mill and fills. Gravel roads eventually wear out from the traffic that's on them. And just like a, a paved road needs an overlay, gravel roads eventually need new material brought in from outside to kind of you know reestablish the the driving surface so uh, again we talked about periodic maintenance which you know to reestablish crown make sure the shoulders are free flowing and the ditches are good on a on a larger scale we need gravel road rehabilitation and that's something I think a lot of agencies, I know we at the DOT were really poor on it because it tends to be a larger cost item, 
but the reality is to keep keep a good gravel road, extend the life, we need to do that periodic maintenance and we need to do that periodic rehabilitation on gravel roads. So I kind of went very quick there at the end because I'm a few minutes over. Before I, I ask if there's any questions again, uh, again, please, any comments? Uh, was this helpful? Uh, you know, what, what could we do? What could I do to make this better? Any subjects you had wanted to hear? Anything I, I spent too much time on? Just anything, any comments that you have that can, can help, help this be a better pre presentation moving forward? Uh, again, I'm available for any questions. My phone number and email is up here. John's phone number and email. I also have Tyson Russ's name and email up here. Tyson is our representative in Oregon, and he handles Oregon, Western Washington, and Alaska. Uh, again, John and Tyson are great, fabulous resources and highly recommend if you haven't met them that you you reach out to them and i guess with that um john any questions comments no mike nothing here still time guys so i'll hang on for a minute if there's if there's anything oh and one other thing let me just ask ask this question is there any other training that we can do both summer or winter that you guys would be interested in? That's 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 kind of what I do with EnviroTech Services is I'm, because this is something I love. I'm passionate about it. Um, so I, that's why I do, you know, uh, gravel road training. Uh, my, kind of my specialty is winter maintenance training. And if there's there's training that you guys would like, we will put it together. All the trainings we do are free. We, you know, don't do sales pitches. We, this, we're, we're doing this to, to help improve the industry. Um, and then, and the other thing I'll say, I also do leadership training. And so if your agency has any interest in leadership training, I had the opportunity to lead several large organizations, and I love sharing sharing that what I learned from my time as a as a leader. Um, so, any any comments, suggestions, any future trainings, anything like that? If you just leave a note, very much appreciated. And if there aren't any questions, I'm just going to say thank you. I know, you know, we we aren't the type of guys that like sitting behind a desk looking at a TV screen for a couple hours. So I really appreciate you taking the time and bearing with me for a couple hours. Hopefully you learned something new or, you know, had some of the things you you thought about reestablished, you know, kind of uh yeah, you're doing the right thing, keep going on it and and uh again, just appreciate your your time. And most importantly, uh, be safe on the roads. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, John? Yeah, thank you, Mike. And thank you all for participating. We appreciate you being here with us today. And then I noticed, uh, Jason, I don't know if you're still on board. Do you have any final comments that you would like to make to the group? I would just uh, echo what Mike said, fellas, for, for those of you that know me or have done training with us in the past you kind of get an idea what's available we are open um, for suggestions requests for training of any sort uh, whether that's in this format with somebody like mike or at your shop or shed um, we that is that is something that is offered just as the you know as a as a partnership gesture and something that we're really uh, feel strongly about in envirotech so don't hesitate to reach out to john or myself or tyson or mike directly if we can help you in that regard, um, another thing I guess I would I would let you know if you don't already. Soil samples are are something that we we do as well. Um, we have a multi million dollar lab with some really smart chemists and and guys with road experience that uh, we can take your um, base material or your you know your original soil material you're working with or whatever it may be and, and do testing on it ahead of time to see if we can help with uh, recommendations, app rates, 
just give you an analysis of what you're working with if you don't already know, and that is also free of charge. So thanks everybody for, for being here. We appreciate your business. Thanks, Mike. Yep. And I should just say, Jason is our West Region manager. So again, fantastic resource. I don't have his email up there, but all of our emails, it's, so his would be jhood at envirotechservices.com. So again, jhood at envirotechservices.com. And Jason would love to talk with you folks also. So uh, with the lack of questions, I'm going to say thank you very much, everybody. Have a uh, great rest of uh, your day. And like I said, be safe on the roads.